My next guest is a purple state governor who ran a campaign that brought together the anti-Trump wing of the Republican Party with today's MAGA conservatives and even won over some Biden voters in the process. He's been out campaigning for Republicans across the country from Nevada to Kansas to Michigan to Georgia. Joining us now exclusively, Governor Glenn Youngkin of Virginia. Governor, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great day. And, and I have to say that uh, being governor in Virginia is a huge privilege. And when we were inaugurated on January 15th, we went right to work. And uh, what's been so exciting is how much we've been able to get done with lowering taxes and investing in schools and in law enforcement and getting Virginia open again. And so I'm just really pleased by the progress we've made in our first nine months. So let's talk about the economy, which I know is a big, a big issue for you uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. President Biden gave a major speech on the economy Friday. He acknowledged uh, inflation is way too high. But take a listen to what else he said. Our economy created 263,000 jobs last month. That's 10 million jobs since I've come into office. That's the fastest job growth at any point of any president in all of American history. Historic progress. The unemployment rate remains at historic low, 3.5 percent unemployment. Now, yes, inflation is at an all-time high, but unemployment is low, job creation is high, wage growth is high, and President Biden says that those parts of the economy are helping the middle class. Is that right? Do you agree? Well, I agree that getting people back to work is critically important, but the reality is we didn't have to be here where we've got this challenged economy. I mean, Decisions were made in early days of the Biden administration to give up our energy independence. Decisions were made in order to encourage people to stay home and keep the economy closed. And in fact, one of the biggest challenges we have today is labor participation. And we see labor participation down across the country. It's one of the big challenges in Virginia. We used to have nearly 67 percent labor participation. Now we're down at 63 and change. And that's a couple hundred thousand workers that have just disappeared. And we need them back. And one of the one of the issues that we see is that unemployment is low because these folks are not participating. And so we've got to get this economy moving in a way that reestablishes our energy independence, pulls people back into the workforce, and just recognizes until we do those two things, we're going to have a lot of challenge addressing, addressing inflation. So let's talk about what you would do to bring down inflation and to bring up uh, worker participation um, without increasing joblessness. Uh, you have a background in business, obviously, at the Carlyle Group. Um, Friday's jobs report showed the economy is slowing, but it's still strong, which makes it likely that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is, is going to hike interest rates even further to try to get inflation under control. Would you support those Fed, right, Fed rate hikes? Well, I, I repeat, we, we don't have to be here. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to but be we here. But we are. But we are. We are. And yeah. I, but I think we have to remember that we got here because of bad policy decisions. And, of course, the reality is the Fed has very blunt instruments, which is to raise rates and to shrink its balance sheet. And when and Virginians and Americans are seeing inflation go through the roof and cost of living skyrocket, and grocery prices and utility bills, and oh, by the way, cost of university tuitions and everything else they're seeing, we've got to find a way to reestablish low energy prices, high labor participation. And in fact, I don't think that the Fed needs to go as far as it has, is, looks like it may go. Mm. And to me, this is a moment where, the, yes, the Fed needed to raise rates, but now we've got to focus on reestablishing our energy independence and bringing energy prices down. That is a supply issue. And we've got to get labor back into the workforce. And that's the kind of the things we're doing in Virginia. I announced an energy plan this week, which is all of the above. Yeah, I want to we talk about We've got to embrace that. all of it. And oh, by the way, we've got 95,000 people come back into the workforce, but we need more. And so we have a massive, massive workforce issue underway that we're going to try to get people back into the work workforce, retrained, and get them off the sidelines. This is what we need to do in order to bring inflation down and have a soft landing, not a hard one. So let's talk about the energy plan, because you just released it this week. It scales back Virginia's wind and solar energy emphasis. Instead, uh, focuses on nuclear power, economic competition. But I wonder if the events in your first year as governor, uh, the more intense hurricanes, which uh, scientists say they're more intense because of climate change, the war in Ukraine and this week's OPEC decision, uh, making uh, the insecurity of where we get our fuel from uh, highlighted. Doesn't that suggest that you should be, that we should be, leaning into more green energy, not less? Well, to be clear, what, I, what I've called for is an all of the above. And in fact, it's not reducing an emphasis on renewables, wind and solar. It's correcting an error that was made in the previous administration's energy plan, which was to exclude everything else. And so we need to, yes, move forward with wind and solar. We need to move forward with carbon capture and natural gas. We need to move forward with nuclear. And one of the things that I believe is that we have a great opportunity in Virginia 
to lead the nation in the development of small modular reactors in nuclear in order to provide baseload power that's clean and reliable and affordable. And this is why common sense has to come back into this equation, which is we, we can't evacuate one of our strengths, which is the fact that we innovate in America. Mm -hmm. and we can, in fact, find a way that natural gas can continue to be a huge part of our overall power stack. We can innovate across nuclear and we can embrace renewables like wind and solar. But we're going to have to adopt all of them in order to get where we want to be, which is reliable, affordable and a clean power stack. Let's talk to one of the key issues that uh, helped get you elected education, um, because you have this new policy for transgender students in Virginia that requires that a student's bathrooms and sports teams should be based on that student's sex assigned at birth, not how they, uh, their, their gender, gender identity. Now, your policy's first two key guiding principles are, quote, parents have the right to make decisions with respect to their children, and, quote, schools shall respect parents' values and beliefs. But I wonder if I don't understand how a one-size-fits-all ruling for all of Virginia follows those guidelines of parents have the right to make decisions and schools shall respect parents. Because I, I imagine in a, in a school in rural southwest Virginia, they might look at this issue quite differently than across the river in Arlington. Let me begin with the, the, these basic principles, which is, f first, parents have a fundamental right to be engaged in their children's lives. And, oh, by the way, Children have a right to have parents engaged in their life, and we needed to fix a wrong. The previous administration had had a policy that excluded parents and, in fact, particularly didn't require the involvement of parents. And, I mean, let's be clear. Parents, uh, parents have this right, and children don't belong to the state. They belong to families. And so in these most important decisions, step one has to be to engage parents, not to the exclusion of a trusted teacher or an advisor, but mm -hmm. to make sure that parents are involved in their children's lives. I, I, this is not controversial. And I just think the idea that we're going to have policies that exclude parents from their children's lives is something that I have been going to work on since day one. We campaigned on it. We empowered parents to make decisions with regards to masking in Virginia. We've empowered parents to make decisions with regards to curriculum that fits their yeah. family's decisions. But, and we're empowering parents here to be engaged in these most important decisions. But, but Governor, this policy could be seen, I could see very easily how it excludes parents. What it, look, here's a question for you. The American Academy of Pediatrics says these kinds of laws about bathrooms and excluding people, uh, ignoring their gender identity. They say, the American Academy of Pediatrics says these kind of laws can increase the risk of depression, anxiety, and even suicide among transgender youth. Did you talk to any, any transgender youth when coming up with this policy? Yes, so we, we've had we've had lots of interactions across the across with transgender the, youth across the, the the administration. And let me just back up. What we're not saying is that there is no accommodation. What we're saying is parents have to be engaged in that decision. And if a child and their parent, along with uh, administrators and teachers, choose to have accommodations for that child, they'll be granted. And see, this is where I constantly get back to. I would ask people to read the policies. And to, I did know, read the policy, well, but it sounds like you're excluding parents that might be supportive of their child uh, going to the bathroom or, going, or joining a sports team that is uh, in alignment with their gender identity. Well, so, so certainly not. If parents actually want their child to be able to change a pronoun or their name or use a bathroom, if parents choose that, then legally that's what the schools will do. With regards to sports teams, this is a different issue. And... And I do believe that it's unfair for girls to have biological boys play sports with biological girls. There are sports with, with, segregated, with segregated sexes uh, for those sports, and those sports should be honored that way. And there are sports where they're not segregated, where, in fact, both, both, both sexes get to play at the same time. Again, there's a common sense approach here to this, and I do think we have to respect girls as well here. Our policies were written. In order, to, in order to respect the dignity of all children, their safety, and their confidentiality. We're in a 30-day comment period, and then we're going to finalize these, and then I expect the school districts to adopt something consistent with them. Let's turn to abortion, because obviously the Supreme Court decision has kicked this back to the states, back to the Commonwealth of Virginia. You're supporting the 15-week abortion ban uh, in, this, in Virginia after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. I know you're trying to be pragmatic, because you think that that's what uh, the state house you think you could probably get it through. Uh, but you also have vowed to, quote, take every action I can to protect life, unquote. So if a six-week abortion ban came to your desk, would you sign it? Well, let me back up. So Virginians elected a, a pro-life governor. 
And I've been very clear. I'm pro-life. I do believe in exceptions and in incest and when the life of the mother is at risk. And in this case, where Virginia was just 22 months ago, was debating on our General Assembly floor that, in fact, abortion should be extended all the way up through and including childbirth and paid for with taxpayer money. And I've said all along that I disagree with this. And that is extreme. That is really extreme. And so when the, when, when the, when the Supreme Court issued their final ruling, uh, we felt that a good place for Virginia to land, which was, which was, a, which was saving lives, because that's what Virginians have said, we would, we would like fewer abortions as opposed to more, is getting our, our leading uh, legislators together and coming up with a compromise bill. Um, as governor, this is progress, and this is a place that I would hope that they can deliver a bill on my desk in January that I can sign that would, in fact, recognize a 15-week limit where, where a child can feel pain. I mean, this is when a child can feel pain, and we should, in fact, recocognize that. And I hope they bring me a 15 At 15 week weeks? Yeah. So, but, but if they brought a six-week one, you would support it? Well, they're not going to bring a six-week bill. I mean, and, and hypotheticals are, are actually just hypotheticals. I do believe... Well, we it's a principle. A- I mean, the principle of that you believe... Abortion should not be legal except for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. And I've been very clear on right. this. Right. So I'm just saying, like, but, so a zero week but, you but would practi- support, too. But practically, okay. as the governor of Virginia, I think that we can, in fact, find, a, find our way to a 15-week bill. And I sure hope that legislators can bring it to me because I, I would sign it. So you're very popular on the campaign trail right now. Lots of governors, Republican governors and candidates uh, bringing you in. You're headed to Arizona to campaign for Republican gubernatorial candidate uh, Carrie Lake. Uh, who has repeatedly denied the fact that you accept that Joe Biden was lawfully, legally, uh, and legitimately elected in 2020. Uh, Carrie Lake has also said if she had been governor, she would not have certified the election, unlike uh, Governor Ducey, uh, your contemporary right now, Republican. Congresswoman Liz Cheney uh, takes issue with you supporting Carrie Lake. Take a listen. Governor Youngkin in Virginia um, is doing a good job. Uh, I think that he's demonstrated that he's somebody... Um, who has not bought into the toxin uh, of Donald Trump. But he campaigned recently for Carrie Lake, who's an election denier, who is dangerous. And that's the kind of thing we cannot see in our party. You haven't gone to Arizona yet, but you were about to. But what's your response? Because I do think that there are a lot of reasonable, pragmatic, fact-based Republicans who are disappointed that you're doing this. In order for us to press forward in the Republican Party, we, in fact, need to do that. Look forward, not backwards. And what I found in Virginia was that we could bring together forever Trumpers and never Trumpers and libertarians and Tea Party members. And oh, by the way, lots of independents and lots of Democrats. And I think that the Republican Party has to be a party where we are not shunning people and excluding them because we don't agree on everything. We just don't agree on everything. But what we can agree on is that, in fact, in states led by Republican governors, those states have outperformed by far states run by Democrat governors. And what Arizona deserves is a Republican governor who will keep taxes down, who will support school choice, who will uh, bring companies into the economy to create opportunity. And that is a heck of a lot better than undoing everything that Governor Ducey has done. And therefore, as I have, as I have supported a handful of candidates and, and campaigned with them, what I find is the same issues everywhere we go, is that Virginians and Americans are worried about the cost of living that is running away from them, making ends meet, safety in their right. community, and they're worried about education. And these are Republican values with common sense solutions that I think Americans want and Arizonans. But that's I thought why, that's why they're going to be much better off with Kerry Lake. And until recently, I thought that standing up for democracy and the rule of law uh, and election integrity was also a Republican value. This isn't a disagreement over tax policy. This woman doesn't believe in legitimate elections. She says that she wouldn't have certified for the election for Joe Biden, which is nothing that you would do. And it's nothing that the current Republican governor did. This isn't just about like, oh, we have a disagreement on education. This is about democracy. Well, let me just step back. First of all, um, this is not about January 6th, right? January 6th was was an abomination. And in fact, uh, anybody who committed violence on January 6th and broke the law should be held fully accountable. This is about making sure that we understand that there is... There is distrust in the election process. Let's just be clear. And oh, by the way, that distrust was expressed by Democrats in 2000 and 2016. I ran against an election denier. But this is different. But this was an effort by the president of the United States to 
to undo the election. It's not just rhetoric or a vote here and there. It was an act. You know this. It was an effort by Donald Trump well, to hold on to power. But I, what, what I do know is that we have we have questions about the election process. And what we've done in Virginia is go to work in order to shore up our election process. And people should trust our election process in Virginia. We passed legislation. I certified machines. And I would hope that I would hope that Carrie Lake, when she's governor, because I think the elector governor will do the exact same thing, which is to do what Florida did after the hanging chat incident, to do what we've done in Virginia, which is to invest in the process to secure confidence in it. This is about future confidence in an election process. And this is what Republican governors should go to work on. And I've seen it all over the country that Republican governors have gone to work to secure the election process, to make people trust it and have faith in mm-hmm. it. And this is what we should be doing. So last question uh, is, it's a, people out there might not know, you can only have one term as governor of Virginia. After that, a uh, White House run? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I am so focused right now on being the best governor in Virginia that I can possibly be. We've got a lot to do. There's real challenges. We've made huge progress, real challenges. I am focused on getting some Republican congressional candidates elected in Virginia and some governors elected around the nation. 2024 is a long way away. And I'm really humbled by the speculation. But right now, I'm very focused on Virginia. All right, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Really appreciate it.